All right, yeah, so, um, well, uh, this is team number two, and uh, our project title is User Population Weighted Density for Coronavirus Spread and Mortality in the United States. Um, team members, Adrienne, she's an applied math student, Hannah, and she's a data science student, and it's me. Um, so uh, the overview of the talk is going to be um, first um, the rationale of the project, uh, why we chose it, and uh, the lit uh, little over literature review and, and objectives, how we compile our data analysis and the result. Um, well, um, the rationale and then how the project actually fits in the mission of DHS and uh, and the center is um, first of all we had this uh, novice pandemic experience and we want to know um, from it and then we want to prepare for the future outbreaks and uh, and secondly and in, in any natural disaster um, result some health crisis so um, and and some of which may be um, uh, spread some, some of may spread and also infectious diseases that in general can be problematic so this is not just specific to COVID so if you have any plan we have plan for any infectious diseases and um, nationally um, the the major cities uh, are usually the uh, national entry ports and uh, and then they were they may be the gateways uh, uh, for the spread for the for, for us if it's not coming from us obviously right and uh, and outbreaks affect labor intensive areas and supply chain both globally and nationally and then ultimately nation's economy may be crippling so it is important that it is controlled so um we also need a um, uh, active response plan uh, so that we don't overcrowd. Um, we don't overcrowd our um, uh, national uh, healthcare system. And uh, it was um, uh, in New York City. At some point, we had to put tents in Central Park because it just couldn't handle it anymore. So we'll get there. And. Um, so and then we also felt like we need a unified reliable COVID-19 data frame because there were uh, uh, different uh, data sets in different sources so um, we needed something reliable so that's that that over that that's aligns with the national department of homeland security's mission and and and, and the center so i'm going to be brief in here so what's out there this is just the this is just a short version of what we have in the references um the martin's paper is only for um the brazil and then they had just the the group level analysis it's a letter to editor and um, the one uses density but it's the raw density and then no other parameters so um there's been some study in the field, obviously. So this is the density one. So this is also raw density, and and then it's also using the uh, reproductive number uh, um, as, as 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 another variable. So, and uh, the psi, I believe this is in the United States, and uh, the the Thomas and Smith, there you. No, Thomas Smith actually, right? So they're using temperature and then population density. So again, the raw density, but they're not just using the temperature, they're also using environmental effects, uh, 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 spread the uh, environmental, how environmental um, factors affect the spread of COVID-19 basically. Okay, so this one is a study. It's not a published article, but it's in, it's from the website of uh, Johns Hopkins University, and they were saying that they actually the density is not really linked to coronavirus spread, 
and they're using and then in their study they also think that um, I mean they, they, they found out that that people over the age of 60 are the biggest um, effect of the, of the of the spread and <clears throat> Baser's study in Turkey, in Turkish data, is the only study outside, along with Korozi, using the weighted density. Um, but what makes Baser, Baser's um, uh, study unique is, is that he also considers other socioeconomical variables. So, um, but his data is very limited uh, because of the country's non-transparency so he had to do propensity score matching to have t similar to 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 the, the data that he has for the city. He matches with other cities so that he actually populates his data set through population through propensity score matching. So it may not reflect one hundred percent what the country is doing basically. So Korotsi is using weighted density. He doesn't say it in the title. Uh, in the United States, um, um, but uh, his result was that weighted density is not it is not that important in the spread of the data, and then we're going to argue contrary in the short term. But what what he was looking at is that full data set of the coronavirus, not necessarily the the early stages of the spread. This because Given given enough time, you know herd immunity is going to happen no matter what, even if you take control of it or you don't. So um, Lima talks about walk walkability and that taking the taking a personal car or, or taking public transportation, and uh, Rasin is just uh, talking about the sixteen I believe uh, European cities and then mobility and that uh, he also considers he or she i don't know so um they also consider um uh, the the hot what they call it hot spot the how many people are moving in and out in a certain spot within the city so uh, and then another high temperature humidity affecting the transmission of covid 19 but this is more like uh, more like about the disease we believe that studying population is as important as studying the disease because after all we are the one who's spreading them so um, now therefore that as an objective we would like to find out the population weighted density we would like to we would like to estimate populate uh, estimate the spread and the mortality uh, in the united states uh, based on population weighted density and and also like some other socioeconomic variables. And secondly, we would like to unify this COVID-19 data, and then we have one and accurate and comprehensive uh, data frame uh, in the country. And uh, we'd like to see how these, um, these variables like spread, the density, mortality, education level, wealth, Healthcare forces, temperature, and all other demographics are actually interplay, and then what kind of relationship they have. And uh, we also would like to look at the population waste weighted density uh, um, to, to, to take informed decisions about how to mobilize the healthcare from high risk places to low risk, risk places. And, um, and then uh, we would we'll, we'll have a national model. And um, and since we cannot compare all 50 states, I mean, we can, but for the purpose of the summer, we compared only six different states, so selected. And uh, we, would, uh, we would, we looked at how they started grouping, um, grouping over time. So in we, 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 that way we can actually decide which states are similar, which states are different and uh, um, what type of policies are actually helping the states better. And we also, um, for example purposes, so we, we picked New York and California, and then we looked at their elasticity. And, 
we would like to lay out some key components uh, to of spread and mortality uh, to help policymakers actually can uh, make, make informed decisions. And well, for the data, I'm going to leave this slide, how we collect it and then how we cleaned it to Hannah. So um, in the process of creating our data frame, while our regressions used numbers um, that had total spread for each of the years that we studied 2020 through 2023, um, in creating our master data frame, we have for all 3,142 counties in the United States, daily cumulative totals of cases for each individual county. Um, initially, we wanted to use a data set from USA Facts, but there were certain irregularities um, within specific counties. So these, uh, these data frames were cumulative and there were unexplained drop offs of as many as 500,000 cases in a single county. And then the data frame just continued on from that. Um, we couldn't find any explanation for these drop offs. And so we decided to look into the John Hopkins University data set. Um, there were a few counties with missing data there. So at the end of the day, we wound up using the John Hopkins data set as our base data set and we supplemented um, missing counties from USA Facts after cross checking with other sources such as the Census Bureau or local governments or the CDC. Um, at the end of it, we believe that we have the most accurate data frame of daily spread in the United States at the county level. Um, for the other data, uh, for the other variables that we used in our study, um, demographic data came from the United States Census Bureau. So that was everything um, healthcare, temperature, age, male female ratio, education <coughs> level and wealth came from the United States Census Bureau and then our weighted density numbers came from Devin Michelle Bunton at MIT. Um, so our confirmed cases and mortality data sets ultimately present an accurate depiction of COVID-19 at the county level between January 22nd and March 9th, 2023, which was the total time of overlap between the John Hopkins University <coughs> data set and the USA Facts data set. It was Incredible. I mean, irregularities until I mean, even like in a single day drop of like 500,000 cases. So uh, the difference between USA fact and, and, and John Hopkins data set basically. Uh, the methods we used is uh, stat uh, the, the regular descriptive statistics and visualization and, and some map, you know, special and uh, spatial analysis. Um, we went through the model selection and then come up with a multivariate regression and then we finally verified our model and uh, we did some analysis of variance for selected states and 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 the uh, shortcomings of uh, analysis of variance has been supplemented by Duncan test so um, and then we determine uh, healthcare policies uh, success healthcare policies and the success of a county with respect to population weighted density. Um, <clears throat> the first descriptive statistics I would like to mention just one thing in here. If you look at the Los Angeles, uh, the, the, it ranks number one in population. That's the most populated uh, 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 county. And, uh, and but it, it ranks in 16 when you compare to uh, the weighted density. So population weighted density of New York City, Manhattan is one, number one, and, and then population wise, it's ranked as 20. So, okay, so Manhattan is not as crowded as Los Angeles, but average New Yorker is living with 137,000 some people within square mile. So there is more human contact in, 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 in New York. And it is, not surprising that New York, the Bronx, the Brooklyn and Queens first four is in New York City. So the the, the most dense uh, uh, city in the United States and the, the second crowd, second most populated county is Cook County, Illinois. This is Chicago area and uh, and but they are ranking in 14 in density. It's still denser than the Los Angeles because Los Angeles is spread out and then and then and the county is hemmed by mountains, so there is less contact. 
<clears throat> so this is some um, uh, the descriptive statistics means and the, and the standard deviation, but it has been adjusted by the weighted mean. I, I can go through quickly. There are 3,142 counties in the United States. Uh, the average American is living with 6,741 people within square mile, and the average temperature of all the counties is 57. And uh, 76,215 healthcare workers on average, and 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 then so on, uh, and then slightly more uh, female than the male. So uh, 102 females per every 100 male. So that's that's a ratio. Okay, that's the only different unit that we have, basically. And if you can look at the average average age. Uh, is so high. I mean, the the senior citizens, 177,000. So it turns out that a lot of the senior people are living in highly dense, dense highly dense cities or other counties in this case. Yes. Uh, so just for clarification, like the means that you see on the left are. Um, if you take the values for each of the 3,142 counties and you sum them and you divide them. So it's just an average of the county Regular statistics average, yeah. taken each as one county. But the ones that you see on the right, each of those counties has been weighted by their population and then it's divided by the entire population. So it's more indicative of what an average person in the United States experiences at in their county level. Um, I think similar to the way that weighted density is also weighted by population, so it's more indicative of what an average person experiences, which we thought was most important right. because one of the defining factors of the spread of disease is going to be human contact. So it's important to know what what kind of life these people are actually living in order to be able to make um, to do analysis on their conditions and the way that they affect the spread of coronavirus. Right. I think it's the, the best way to read this is like, say, senior citizens, 177,436 seniors and then per square mile, because that's weighted density, the, that, 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 that unit per is in county. it. Yeah, and per county, yes. So um, overall spread is given in this graph. So on the left and the right is the mortality. So the the um, the orange one is ultimate spread. Basically, this is cumulative. This is 2023, the orange one, and then blue is the 2020 spread, and it clearly shows a rising trend as the uh, the weighted as as the density gets higher, spread gets higher, and uh, and then 2020 uh, spread is lower than 2023. Similar results in um, in uh, the mortality, uh, but uh, there are more zeros in here um, pulling the, the the regression line down. It's because not everyone who gets COVID actually dies. So um, we decided that okay, so eventually everybody gets the herd immunity. So it is important that that we look at the COVID spread in early stage. So the first graph you see here is the first week of the COVID spread um, versus the, the, the weighted density. So as you can see that the, the dense areas, the, the COVID started in the dense areas first within the first week. And then this is the first month. Within the first month, not only it spills, but it goes up. And within the sixth month, Within the six month, all the less dense areas are also infected. So, and within the six months, the disease actually catches the shape of the ultimate spread. So, what that means is that if we want to contain this disease or any infectious disease, we are actually racing with time. So, this is the shape of in six months, and then this is the shape in three years. So so I think uh, this time frame is um, should be an indicative for the policymakers to implement whatever needs to be implemented early on to contain the disease. 
And uh, the correlation matrix is telling us that spread is highly correlated with the seniors, coincides with the research that's been done in John Hopkins University. Our seniors are 65 and older. John Hopkins were 60 and older. And, uh, and the, the, the second biggest correlation is healthcare workers. Um, the reason for that is there are bigger hospitals, more hospitals in urban areas, and then obviously there will be more healthcare workers. And then there is, where there is more healthcare workers and then there is more healthcare, and it's likely that we are going to get tested more. They're going to have more tests. So it is highly correlated. It is expected. And the third, uh, the highly correlated item is the weighted density with about 80%. OK, so. Well, this is just the same thing in pictures. As you can see, the healthcare workers, seniors, and uh, the density is highly correlated and uh, education is somehow. OK, I left out others because the pictures was getting too big. All right, so here are some special spatial visualization, and I think this is nice. Go ahead, Anna. Um, so this map kind of speaks directly to our main purpose in this project, and it highlights the relationship between weighted density and the spread of uh, the coronavirus, the number of confirmed cases. So these bigger bubbles that you see are going to be areas that have the highest weighted density. As you can see right over here in New York City, we have lots of them. We have the four highest weighted dense counties in the United States. So that's why these bubbles are so big here. Um, and the redder these bubbles are, the more confirmed cases we see. Um, and so we just think that this map allows you to really see those pockets where weighted density is very, very high. We also see a very, very high amount of spread. And we chose our states based on this map, by the way, so. Um, and so on the other hand, this map reveals the relative spread. So this is the number of COVID-19 cases per 100 people not infected. So how severe it was on your individual county level. You know, like 10 cases in a really small county is a lot different than 10 cases in New York City. So this one kind of puts it into that perspective. Um, and so we can still see these areas that we know are dense. We have New York City right over here. Um, we have Los Angeles area down here, Dallas, Miami. Um, so we still see these <coughs> pockets of areas with high weighted density correlating with high spread, but we also see a little bit of a different picture. Um, and when I made this map, I couldn't help but think about <laughs> the map for the like political affiliation of counties in the United States. So this is the 2020 election map. And we can see that right in here, we have this like pocket of red all down Florida. We're up here, we have all of these democratic counties. And we see those same trends here. Um, and I thought it was worth mentioning because there have been a great deal of studies done on the mortality rate and political affiliation. Most recently, I read one from Yale University that said excess mortality was actually 43% higher in registered Republicans than it was in registered Democrats after the dissemination of vaccinations. And so there's been a lot of studies done on mortality, but as we can see from these maps, the correlation between political affiliation and spread because of how this pandemic was handled in the media and because of like a lot of extenuating factors in COVID-19 that we might not see with other diseases, we can see a clear correlation between um, what people believed about the COVID-19 pandemic or whatever it may be and the way that it's spread across the United States. And I think it's very important to look at because we know that if these counties are experiencing more severe spread, they're also more likely to be experiencing a higher mortality rate based on current literature. OK, so this is our model selection process. Uh, the, the algorithm works as like uh, the, the variables enter the system with their uh, importance uh, in terms of correlation. Uh, Adriana? Yeah, so, so I'll show <laughs> you tell I'll, I'll point out. Yeah, so yeah. before we decided to point out use our model, we decided that we wanted to pick the best regression model amongst other models. So we relied on the R square value, which would tell us the percent percentage of variation that can be explained by our data. And then we also decided to use the model coefficient, 
So the mass coefficient is C, the subtract P, with P being the number of variables we have. So in order for us to have no bias in our model, um, it would have to be the number of variables we have plus one, so we would have to get eight. So we started with seniors because seniors were highly correlated. And as you can see, it does have a high R squared value. However, the bias is also very large. So then we start feeding in variables individually. And as we look down, the R squared value starts to increase all the way to 95.88%. And the bias is eight, which means that we have no bias in our model. And we also did the same thing for the mortality model on the right. So um, the, our um, spread model explains 96% of the variation within the within the data, and the, and the mortality is 93%. So mortality is not doing as well as the spread. Uh, we'll get to the. So why is that? Okay, so these are the two models. So next, this is going to be the models for both the spread and the mortality. So the parameter estimate are just going to be our coefficient for every variable. So as we can see, the intercept, the weighted density, seniors and total healthcare workers all have a positive relationship with spread. Um, the income, the education, temperature and female to male. Oh, sorry, not temperature, but female to male ratio has a negative relationship with the spread. Um, and then we can see on the right that the P values are all less than 5%. Um, income is on the border, but we consider that to be significant. So they're all significant to the model. And then next we have the variation explanation. Um, as you can see, the seniors and the total healthcare workers, they both have a high variation inflation, but we still kept it because the threshold is usually five and there's no maximum on the variation inflation. So we still kept it in our model. And it's going to be the same thing for the mortality, different coefficients. However, the variation inflation is going to be the same for each variable. Um, well, we have seen that the dominant factor here on the seniors. So since this is already logged, so the spread is also logged. What that means is that a single percentage increase in the seniors population will result 83% of the spread in the disease. So this is significant and it, we wanted to see what's going on with that. So now the first graph shows that um, this is, I believe, not the all, uh, all represented. These are, yeah. 150 counties. 150 counties out. That out create of, a representative sample. Right. Otherwise it was getting too crowded. So, so dense air, so it looks like the more people are living, more senior people are living in the dense areas and the mortality rate also very high in that. So um, the uh, the color shows the mortality. Confirm that and um, and the size of the bubble shows how big the senior population was there. So now if you look at the percentage wise, the relative mortality and, and, and relative seniors, it shifts to the relatively high and relatively uh, 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 dense areas or, or less dense areas. So we think that the most of the. So these mortalities are shifting. So it looks like the more people, more, more mortality is coming from the, the senior groups and, uh, and, 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 and percentage wise, there are more seniors within the less dense areas, but number wise, there are more senior people are living within uh, dense areas. So it just confirms that the seniors, 65 to 75, are the, the the number of deaths are the highest among them. So the graph confirms actually why why that's the case. And if you could remember the shape of our spread, this also represents exactly the shape of our spread. No wonder the seniors are actually coming out so significant in our model. The one percentage of increase in senior population. 
increase in the spread. Okay, so um, we looked at New York City and 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 Cal New York and California as a state to see how this how this elasticity is changing. Uh, so uh, now this is the time, and and the white coordinate is the spread. So as soon as the outbreak happened, so the spread shoots up, right? So the the rate at which the disease is actually spreading is high at this point. And that rate of the speed of the spread is going down right away. So that means New York responded quite fast, okay? And then bend the curve right away. And I looked at this breaking point in my list of important dates. That 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 breaking point comes to the travel advisory. So travel advisory public policy actually bend the curve even more, meaning that the rate at which the spread the disease is spreading is getting less and less. So the, the we, we slow it down right away within the first few months. And um, so by January 21st, uh, we had the first vaccination. Within the vaccination, herd immunity started happening. So while there is no uh, higher speed for the, for the spread, but there is still shift going up. So what that means is that, okay, the speed is not increasing, speed is now steady, but there is a steady people catching COVID in the meantime. Okay, so that 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 that, that trend still goes up. And by the time March 2022, I think country-wise, the whole, uh, I mean, we have we, we've reached the uh, the herd immunity basically. So, and that will be clear with the with the time series that 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 is coming. OK, so let's look at California. California reacted differently, right? It took about four months for Californians to Californian. Is that a word? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so it took about four months for Californians to actually react to the disease. So they started bending the curve somewhere around, I'm thinking, September. Uh, no, the right before August, July, July 2020. So, um, but even then, uh, you know, and, and in November 20, uh, they started to flatten the curve. So, which is uh, which is about um, the when the first uh, the vaccination started to roll out. So, um, we didn't do this for every state. So, this is some uh, this is a representative. So, we need to understand the population to actually um, uh, to, 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 to uh, slow down the spread or, or maybe stop the spread. So as well as the disease itself. Um, here is an analysis of variants on six states. It's we took Arizona, California, Florida, Illinois, New York and Texas. OK. And then how they are grouping and how they are different, it is not that clear. Adriana? Yeah, so we decided to perform the analysis of variants on these six states. Um, but as you can see, sometimes it's not easy to tell based on the box, uh, box plot if the means are significantly different or they're significantly the same, except if they have a clearly distinct difference. So we decided to look at March 2020, October 2020, and February 2023. So what we could understand from these box plots is that um, New York, at first it starts with the highest number of COVID cases, but then as time goes on, it goes down and the other states rises. But the best way we thought to represent this information was to do a Duncan test. So we decided to do the Duncan test, but instead of looking at those time periods, we also decided to look at March 2020, May 2020, October 2020, November 2021, February 2022, and February 2023. So in the first Duncan test, um, New York has the highest COVID rates. Um, California, Arizona, Florida, all 
had the same bar, which means that their COVID spread rates wasn't significantly different, so therefore they're the same. And Illinois and Texas, they were also the same. So as we look and throughout the time, in May 2020, it starts to change a little bit more. So um, New York, Arizona, California, and Florida are all significantly the same in terms of spread. Illinois and Texas are not are now not the same. And as we move to October 2020, that's where we see the biggest shift. New York is does not have the highest number of COVID cases anymore. And now it's Florida, Arizona, and California with the highest cases, and they're not significantly different. And New York, Illinois, and Texas are around the same amount. Now, when we look at October, when we look at November 2021, though, um, Arizona, California, Florida, and New York, they all have the same amount of COVID spread, and Illinois and Texas the same. Um, February 22 and February 23 has the same um, pattern, which means that Arizona, California, Florida, and New York have around the same COVID spread. Illinois and Texas have different ones. So we think that this will be important for um, policymakers in case like they want to look over time to see which states are doing good in handling COVID. So at first in March 2020, they would allocate all their resources to New York based on how high the spread is. And then as you can see, um, over time in October 2020, New York no longer is a priority because it doesn't have the highest spread. Now they would focus on allocating their resources to places like Florida, Arizona, and California. So we think um, it would just be best, like if um, policymakers look at this to see over time which states need the most resources given the time that they're looking at. Also, this probably, you know, tells about the success of the policy, so success of the how the policy is implemented in the in the state. Successful state, so New York did well with whatever it's got, I guess. You know lowering down itself to Illinois and Texas level. So, Anna, the time series. Well, yeah, so this is a graph of a time series for the um, coronavirus spread on the county level in California. Um, and we put these lines in to kind of show where we saw like uh, breaks in the slope, like where, where it seemed to level out for a second. And we matched that with a list of um, policies implemented at the state level. Um, and we have this for many different states, but in California, the first shift that we see is right around here where this slope, um, it breaks. So it breaks from this very, very steep rise. California was put under a lockdown in April 2020. Right over here, we see a mask mandate. And then um, across the country, we see vaccination access. And for California, the widespread vaccination access happened in February 2021. Um, so we thought that these maps would be helpful for us to kind of analyze what policies did in different states, if they acted the same across different states, and what we can learn from the timing and the kinds of policies. So for California, we see that the lockdown and their mask mandate were both effective in helping to slow the spread of COVID-19 at the county level. And vaccination <coughs> access, we'll see, was effective on the countrywide level. We see the same trend right around early 2021 for every state that we've looked at. Um, for Florida. No. Oh, yeah. So in Florida, we see kind of a different story. Um, they like their lockdown ended before a lot of people had either even put in lockdowns or definitely before those lockdowns were lifted. Um, and so their lockdown was not even in place for a month, which is why you don't see it right here. But their lockdown ends and we see cases start to shoot up again. Um, and they also never allowed for a statewide mask mandate. In fact, they weren't, they rejected a statewide <coughs> mask mandate. But in August of 2020, they officially allowed um, individual counties and cities to install their own mask mandates. And in Miami-Dade, Broward County, um, and actually all four of these counties, which are the most populated counties in Florida, you did see a mask mandate between um, late July and late August of 2020. And so we can see that these mask mandates in these counties did have a slowing, a chilling effect on um, the spread of COVID-19. Uh, 
vaccination bending effect, I think. See, this is still rising after vaccination. But Californians, was the biggest effect is just flat. So, yeah. yeah. And so we thought we thought talking about the vaccination access in Florida was interesting because based on our research, vaccination access was one not clearly communicated. Um, they did it out. They did it in a series of five different phases, and oftentimes reporting said that it was difficult to discern who was eligible for vaccines. And you also saw vaccination numbers rise a lot slower in Florida than you did in other states. So it's one of the reasons we believe that we don't see the same chilling effect in um, in Florida as we did in California. Um, New York, I know we, we've said it a lot and we're from New York, so maybe we're a little biased, but New York really did respond very quickly to the, uh, COVID-19. And we think that this graph and um, other numbers are very indicative of that. Almost immediately, New York had a lockdown and their mask mandate, and it's clearly seen um, that the lockdown slowed that curve and that mask mandate helps to flatten the curve. Um, New Yorkers, you know, we speak from experience here in the sense that like New Yorkers were very good about their adherence to COVID-19 policies. Um, and so vaccination access, we see the same kind of flattening as we did in California, unlike Florida. And then actually New York implemented another mask mandate in 2022, specifically for public transit and other like highly populated spaces, government buildings. And so we see the chilling effect there as well. Um, and so lastly, this is just the time series of um, the six states that we selected to look at um, on their state level. Uh, the <coughs> dotted black line that you see is the United States mean, and we just wanted to notate where vaccination rollouts begin, like around the time when most states started seeing widespread vaccination access. Um, and we also thought it was interesting to look at the differences up until vaccination rollout did begin, because after these vaccines roll out, we see every state starts to stabilize, whether more or less than other states, but we definitely see that trend right here. Um, whereas around here, we have very, very different trends for how things spread. We have New York shooting up quickly and leveling out. We have Texas kind of making their <laughs> slow but somewhat steep rise to join Illinois up there. Um, but as we've said, like vaccination rollout did seem to have the most chilling effect on COVID-19 spread across all, all states that we analyzed. Um, this is a map of residuals, which is the, the error. So uh, the white spots are the errors within 5%. So um, which is telling us that our model actually captures the dynamic of the spread quite well especially in the crowded areas and the places that places that if you can remember the spread map earlier uh, the place the northwest really did well in terms of uh, spread where we overestimated places that actually uh, didn't do well midwest and right here right is that also the midwest no well, I don't know. <laughs> OK, so uh, so we overestimate, we underestimate those. So um, there are some outliers, obviously, um, and we didn't capture. But this thing actually tells us that we have very little error and that our model explains 96 percent of the variation. So the most of the counties in the United States fall within 5% of uh, the, the, the error in terms of our model. Um, as I mentioned, that that the mortality didn't capture all that much because of probably the, the um, uh, comorbidities of the of, 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 of people. People might have other sicknesses. People might have other shortcomings or maybe they're just uh, uh, you know um, because of the age they have less immune system um, uh, that's why the, uh, the the death model is not capturing fully um, um, uh, but we still see the same trend northwest is uh, overestimating and then somewhat like a middle part of america is underestimating 
this is somewhat the same, similar trend with the with with the spread. OK, so overall, the spread is a pretty good model. <clears throat> and here are some numbers from New York City. Yeah? So the average New Yorker lives with 35,000 people within one square mile. It's not Manhattan. I, I, I mean, New York, not New York City, I'm sorry, New York State. OK, so New York City is 137,000 within square mile, which is Manhattan. OK, so. Um, and the average education level of New York uh, State is 38 percent for your college or higher. Uh, average population of seniors are 211,000. And um, there is uh, slightly more female population than the male population. And the average uh, per capita income is 77,000. And uh, number of healthcare workers is 116,000. You need to read this thing per square mile, each one of them. I, I, I can't forget to say that, per county. Per square mile per county, that's our unit. Um, I, I, it's 1,000, I mean 116,000 healthcare workers in New York State per square mile. The reason that this is so high, it's because of the weighted density of the city. Okay, so, but the statewide, the plain mean is average uh, healthcare workers in the whole state of New York is 26,000, 27,000. Okay, so <clears throat> the reason that these two bullet points next to each other, it just tells you the gravity of the situation. New York County, which is the borough of Manhattan, is 1600% more dense than the average, uh, uh, the density of the New York, New York State average. So um, I'm going to take a very extreme example and then, and then show you that it still falls within the 5%. So the, which is Brooklyn, population uh, density wise, 25% that more dense than the Queens. Um, keeping all other variables constant, just looking at the density itself only. Um, the, our model estimated that then King, Kings County should be 2% higher. The spread of the King County should be 2% higher than the Queens. But the actual was 6.5, which, which still falls in within 5% the error. And we need to note that about 80% of the population lives in a county is above the national average. So, um, uh, so people are living in a denser areas. I mean, United States, 80% of them. So <clears throat> now counties with the higher education level. And that has also significant in the opposite direction. So if you have 10%, if you increase their high, higher ed education by 10%, then lower the spread of the disease 1.6%. So this might be because the educated people understand the disease better. Maybe they have means to uh, work from home uh, because of their education level, I guess. So. Um, so we see an uh, inverse trend in here. So, um, but the education wise that 80% of the population in a county lives above the national average of education level. So 80% of these population, they have higher than the average education level, right? Oh, oh, it shows it there, right? Yeah. So, well, we already said that each percentage is increasing the spread by 83% in terms of seniors, and then more seniors are living in, 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 in every county that are above the national average. And uh, healthcare workers is the same, 10% higher healthcare workers result 1.3% higher disease. And uh, Counties with 1% higher female to male ratio associated with 
6% lower disease spread. The more females, less spread. Um, maybe the males are not as responsive, but the research actually show that some papers show that the, uh, the, the males are more prone to the disease and then consequences of the disease is more, yeah. But, um, but where there is more women, there is less disease. Looks like it. <laughs> so income per capita is also inversely related because income per capita is collinearly dependent to the education. So it just makes sense that income capita is also inversely related with the uh, with the with the spread. Every 10 percent increase will result about um, uh, 0.63 percent lower is, uh, the, the lower spread. The temperature wise, OK, this is a bit of contradicting. So the, the we found that the 1 percent higher temperature will associate half percentage of higher disease spread. And this is not supporting Wang and Baser. They are saying that higher temperature and a lower uh, 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 spread. But we realized that that the most of the US population is actually living 10 degrees in living in the states that are 10 degrees warmer than the average national temperature. So there's 63 percent of the Americans are actually living in a warmer areas. So that means more people, more spread. So but effect is very little. One percent higher, half a percent spread. So now the when when within the few months then uh, the New York City needed help. So um, a lot of uh, some people, some healthcare workers came from uh, uh, San Francisco, even though they had a higher rate uh, to help us out. And uh, like I said, we had the tents in the Central Park and uh, U US uh, uh, Department of Defense sent the uh, United States Navy Hospital, USNS, right, Comfort. And here it's pulling into the harbor through uh, Hudson and then docked into uh, Chelsea Piers, where there's nearby the Javits Center. And uh, so this is Javits Center, uh, United States Navy personnel is helping out. And then and then they are also used. They we were also using this hospital ship that was fully functioning hospital. Basically, so it is important where there is how you want to reallocate your resources. So we get some resources from San Francisco, which is way too far, and we had the US Navy to help us. Now that brings us to how to reallocate resource healthcare resources. Huh? Yeah. So as we saw in the last slide, these healthcare workers were coming from San Francisco, which is another county that does have a very high weighted density and also was hit relatively hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we thought it would probably be better to look at our local resources and be able to allocate them um, in a way that we know isn't going to disadvantage any community that we're taking from. So the graph that you see on your screen, um, the size of these bubbles are going to be the number of healthcare workers per 100 residents. We wanted to make this relative because we think it's important that you know how many people are taking care of your people. And if it's just in raw numbers, then we're not going to see the same picture. And so similarly, we also have COVID-19 cases per 100 residents. So green, big bubbles means that COVID didn't hit their population particularly hard and they have more healthcare resources per person than other counties. These are great counties to pull from and reallocate towards redder bubbles, towards these areas that are seeing a higher level of severity relative to their population in their county. And doing this on the state level allows us to uh, view it in the context of the density. We do. We believe that we should be moving upwards on this map um, because as you can see, these weighted dense areas were hit harder by the pandemic than these areas that fall under this uh, level of density. So places like Albany, places like Westchester, Montgomery, there's a few on the map, and obviously this is just for New York State, would, would be better picks to reallocate resources towards places like Richmond or Queens or even New York. Um, that way we're not pulling from another place on the other side of the country with a very high weighted density when we could be pulling from our local resources. 
Well, this is relative mortality rate uh, with the population weighted density. It, it shows that somehow um, um, there is less mortality in the dense areas. And uh, we, we think that this is because they, are, they enjoy better healthcare system in the, in, in, in the metropolitan areas. That's, what, that's why there, there is less density. And it's consistent with the literature, by the way. And um, this is the uh, somehow ranking the states and rewarding them if they did well. So um, we thought that uh, we, we would get the mortality rate, uh, the, 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 the amount, um, amount of death per spread, per spread. And, um, and then, yeah, so um, we kind of ranked, so the Wayne and then Lake and Colorado, Los Angeles is doing better. And uh, the, the, the bottom of the counties are not doing as well. So, um, well, conclusion is that we, um, to control and manage the outbreak, the time is in the essence, and then we need to move in early. And uh, we think that the weighted density can be a useful tool to actually uh, uh, strategize um, the, the policies. And, um, and uh, our study also delineates uh, the, the importance of the uh, densely populated areas. And the study also recommends prioritizing public health in densely populated areas. And uh, we also think that um, um, the um, county prediction in both spread of mortality with healthcare resources and other demographics can be used to control and manage the outbreaks. So, and then crucial timelines and policies are actually put forward. And then the vaccination was the biggest curve bending and then along with the travel advisory coming second. So the biggest um, control healthcare decision was the vaccination, and the second was the travel ban, basically. And for the future work, we think that um, that not many people get vaccinated. Maybe uh, um, the the government mandate should be looked at. And uh, currently, uh, we are actually collecting. We are preparing a uh, a. a, a um, uh, survey for that and secondly the distribution of the vaccination was a bit of chaos I think uh, we could do a linear programming for the, based on weighted density and other prioritized variables to actually put forward some kind of logistics or, or, or supply chain and the economic impact of the COVID-19 has been studied but not extensively uh, we are in the search of uh, I think Julia has recommended somebody from University of Chicago, so we're going to look into that. And um, and that impact of the mask mandate in the workplace uh, actually uh, believe that they reduced the productivity. So uh, small clinical data is available. I have it, but uh, it, it may be too little. Um, and then lastly, uh, there could be some kind of machine learning model based on the logistic regression to see uh, when to uh, take action, like in terms of when to put the travel ban, when to put the, uh, um, um, the, the, the mask mandate. So uh, there should be a nice uh, clear cut um, um, the policies based on this model um, using uh, density and the reproductive number by the county. And um, we would like to thank Julia for her mentoring and recommendation. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> and uh, she was uh, recommending the methods. Uh, it was a blast. <laughs> some, some, time, some time, some resources. Uh, and I'm still waiting for that economics. I hope we can get it. And uh, we would like to thank um, Dr. Uh, Majewski, Dr. Mirkandani, and Dr. For their guidance and support for every every weekly meetings that we've had. So um, thank you, and uh, also staff members Amy, Casey, and Zachary. Uh, the, the, their logistics, uh, their welcoming uh, help, and and continuing support while we are staying here. And uh, uh, last but not the least, 
Department of Homeland Security and the Center and Arise, right, um, uh, that, that made this research possible. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And that's our <laughs> social outing. <laughs> Any questions? Please feel free. Sorry that I was out of time. Okay. Sorry for this. Thank you. Thank you all. So you're already applying to grad school here at ASU now. Work with we'll you see. Okay. That means yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the summer. Here in grad you're already school. Here, you're here at the worst part of the year. Yeah. Yeah, which you know makes it harder to come back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions okay. from the online folks? I, I, I just want to comment. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? It was breaking up, so we couldn't hear you. Okay. I want to comment that it's all an excellent report, and I thank the team, team for doing such a great job. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> yeah, this is very solid. It's like a, almost like a faculty type presentation, like if you're interviewing for a job or something, maybe. I don't know, maybe maybe it's a hint. Maybe we got to try to be recruiting not just the students, but uh, Dr. Yuchi, he's there. This is very good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I have another profession going. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, re it's really good, guys. I hope you guys are going to uh, turn this into a journal article. I, I think you're working on that. Oh, it's really already good. <laughs> It's already done. Somebody else is actually reviewing for the you know, the grammatical errors and exposition of the paper. So hopefully I'll be submitting in a few months. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, this is Beth Jones in, in Washington, D.C. I'm with the CAOE. I wanted to congratulate all of you. Um, the graphics were, um, I think, particularly um, well done. So very good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.